Well, if I can bring your attention back up here, we will have another time of a uh, longer time of discussion at the end of the message. We have been I uh, just I'm hearing something but I'm not sure what. Okay, for we have been uh, working through a series of talks on what's called the Lord's Prayer. This is referring to Jesus and he was teaching his disciples how to pray. And this was a part of a bigger speech or sermon that he was giving. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, he was explaining what life in the kingdom of heaven looks like. If you become a citizen of his kingdom, this is what the life of the kingdom looks like. And this prayer is the way that we are to pray as citizens of this kingdom. And we remember the first part of this prayer starts out with our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed or special, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And so the first thing we see at this first part of the prayer is that it's God focused. It's all about God. And what's amazing is that Jesus is saying, if you come into this kingdom, you will have a special relationship with God as Father. He is our Father. So the first thing we can say about this kingdom is that it's a relational kingdom. God loves relationships. He especially loves relationships with each and every one of us. That's what God desires. Last week, we then started moving into the next part of the prayer, which is the statement, remember, give us this day our daily bread. That's what we looked at last week. And it's, it's how God wants us to come to him as a father for our daily physical needs. He wants to be there for us. There's nothing too small in our lives that he's not interested in, that he does not want us to come to him for. He wants us to learn a relationship of trust and dependence upon him. He wants us also not to worry about tomorrow, next week, next year, but just take life one day at a time, trusting in him for our daily, daily bread. Okay, that's where we ended up last week. So today we move to the next phrase or statement. Jesus says, forgive us our debts. We're, we're saying this to the Father. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now what's interesting about this is that just a couple of verses later, Jesus says again, about forgiveness in verses 14 and 15. If you forgive others their transgressions, for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, think about this for a moment. This is not a real long prayer that Jesus is teaching us. It's a pretty short prayer. But in, in two separate occasions, he brings up the subject of forgiveness. So that tells us something, that he is serious about us learning about forgiveness. Now why? Why is God so serious to bring up this subject this theme two times in a short prayer? Well, it's because if it's a relational kingdom, 
then when we sin or when we hurt or offend or transgress against one another, and we do this all the time because we're human beings living in close proxemics to each other. And so God knows that in order for his kingdom to be a healthy relational kingdom, we need to know about forgiveness. Not just in our heads, but we need to be practicing a life of forgiveness. And so that's what we're going to talk about, because he knows that when we do not forgive, it breaks relationships. When relationships break down, then the, the atmosphere of that community breaks down with it. So that's why we can see that God is bringing this up not once but twice in this short prayer. Okay? So let's first define what do we mean when we say we are forgiving someone. It means to cancel all debt, all expectation of payback. We want them to pay for what they've done to us. And we say, no, I don't expect any payment from you. You do not have to pay me back. I let go of what you owe me. I let it go. And I no longer demand that from you. And when we forgive, and when we are forgiven by others, this leads us to that possibility of restored relationships with one another. Okay? So that's the definition of it. So in this prayer, God is saying, I, um, we are to uh, ask God for forgiveness as we are asking others for forgiveness. So it's this, we need to keep our relationship with God clear, and we need to keep our relationships with one another, and they're related to each other. All right? Okay, so there are, are three things that we need to understand about forgiveness that will help us to develop a lifestyle of forgiving. And that is this. First of all, we must understand how much God has forgiven us. This is the basis of everything that comes after is the first step, which is God has gone to great lengths to forgive us of all of our sins. That's the whole purpose of the cross. That's why Jesus went to the cross, was to die for, the, for that which broke. We, we sinned against God, broke relationship with God, and we needed to be forgiven. And Jesus paid the price of uh, our sin so that we could be reconciled and back into a relationship with God. It's all about forgiveness, what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, so that's number one. We must understand that. Secondly, we must understand that God commands us to forgive. This is not an option in his kingdom. This is a command. We must do this with one another. And finally, I want to look at what happens to us when we do not forgive. What's the consequence of that? So those are the three things we'll be looking at right now. The first thing is, again, we must understand the depth of our sin and the depth of what God has done to forgive us of our sins. I don't know if you have ever said this yourself, done this yourself, or heard someone else say this, but they say something like this, you know, I'm, I'm really not that bad of a person. I try to be a good person. I mean, I haven't killed anybody. And, and when I compare myself with, I'm not going to point out in the room because I don't want to make you nervous, I'll pretend there's somebody over here. I compare myself to this person over here. I'm not so bad. I'm looking okay. I think God, most likely, I, I'm assuming he's going to accept me. 
But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible says, first of all, we are not to compare ourselves with one another. We are to be comparing ourselves with God. God the holy, remember he's hallowed, he's in heaven, he's far beyond us in every sense of the word. If we compare ourselves with God, we do not compare, okay? We are not holy, we are not righteous, we are not anything like God in that sense. And I want us to read a parable that Jesus told in another gospel uh, that will illustrate this very, very clearly. Let's read together from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, which is like a religious leader, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the first thing we need to do is to have an accurate and true picture of ourselves in relationship to God. We are sinners have fallen far short of the standard that God has, the purity, the holiness. None of us can stand on our own before God. So we would be quickly humbled by any thoughts that we have any righteousness that God is interested in. In fact, it says in the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 6, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garment, and all of us uh, wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. This is the truth about each and every one of us before God. But here's the thing. What is God's response to us in that condition? He forgives us of our sins. He's forgiving God. This is one of the, the core characteristics of God, is he's a forgiving God. Micah, chapter 7, verse 19, says about God, He will have, again, have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. Okay? takes our sins, tramples them, picks them up, and throws them into the deepest sea. And then, as someone once said, he puts this sign over that place called no fishing. Okay, you don't go there and start trying to pull this stuff up out again. There's no fishing there. Once I throw it there, it's gone. We don't bring this up anymore. This is how God responds to our sin. Psalm 103, verse 12 says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is the God whom we are speaking about, whom we are inviting all of you to be in relationship with. Because this is a wonderful gift that he gives to us. 
when we receive this gift, when we enter into the kingdom of heaven, God's forgiveness. And this was all made possible once again through the death of Jesus on the cross. And that's what we celebrate right here in front of us. This is what this means, the bread and the cup. All right? So that's the first thing, uh, what God has done for us. Secondly, uh, we, we have to understand that when we enter into the kingdom, by God's grace, he says to us, now I want you to be like me. I want you to forgive like I forgive. It's a command. And, you know, it's, it's the, one of the most difficult commandments that he gives to us is to forgive, to choose to forgive each and every time. I want to go through just three steps, practical steps, of what does it look like, uh, what steps we need to take in order to forgive someone else. Okay, you ready? What do we do? Step number one, name the sin or offense. Name it. We need to know specifically, concretely, and clearly what is the offense or trespass or sin that was committed against us or that we committed against someone else. Because you cannot forgive what you cannot name. What's your problem? Well, I don't know. Okay, when you, you've been in conversations like that, what's the matter? I don't know. What's the matter with you? I don't know. That conversation doesn't go very far because you don't know. You need to start to define and clarify what's going on, what happened specifically. Okay? And while we're trying to figure this out, we need not to minimize what has happened to us. We are not to say, well, you know, actually, when I think about it, he didn't really know what he was doing. So, he was really doing the best he could. But that's fine. But guess what? I was damaged by that sin. I have pain. I have rejection. I have hurt in my life. I need to call that what it is. Not minimize that. We need to acknowledge the damage that is done to our relationships because of these things that we do to one another. And it's only when we can be clearly clear about the sin, the offense, the, the uh, transgression, whatever it is that person has done, and acknowledge the damage that it's done, then we can move to the second step, which is to say, I forgive you. This is what we've done. This is what you did. This is how it impacted me. But now I move to forgive. This is where we can get stuck. Because I, I don't know about you, but I m might have the, the, the idea of hanging on to my hurts and my wounds. To, to address them, to nurse them, to take care of them, to talk to people about them, to tell people how much I've suffered because of someone else's sin against me. There's something, I don't know, something comforting, kind of in a sick sort of way, but we can, we can fail to move from, from step one to step two. But step two is we, we identify it in order to forgive. And that's so hard when we want to demand justice. We want that person to pay for what they've done to us. Anybody ever felt that? That strong sense of justice? And you may be perfectly right. But guess what? God says, I'll take care of the justice part. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will do the repaying if that's necessary, but I am commanding you to forgive. I'm commanding you to not demand that payment, but let that person go. Forgiveness is an act of the will. 
It's not an emotion. If we're waiting for our emotions, we're not going to do much forgiving. But if we do it as an act of the will, we will forgive each time. We will to cancel the debt that someone else owes us. We will to hand it over to God and say, I'll let you deal with this other person's heart. I am going to let them go. Here's something interesting about this process. When we forgive, when we set a person free and say, I don't demand payment from you, when we let that other person go, guess who else is set free? We are. And I had this picture this week, like, when I do not forgive another person, it is like I am bound to them in unforgiveness. And there's like a metal wire that's wrapped around the both of us, and we're tied together because of unforgiveness and bitterness. But when I cut the cords through forgiveness, and I let that person go free, I'm also going free. I'm also able now to walk away in freedom from this offense. That's an amazing thing to, to think about. And then the third step is we give up resentment and revenge. We give up our rights to that. We forget about it. We forget about it. All the resentments and the revenge is released and we let it go. We don't go back there again. How hard is that to do? Anybody struggle with that? To, to let go once you say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And and then I, I don't have any further thoughts about that. Paying payment, ruminating in my mind how I'm going to say something sharp to you or, or some other type of revenge, all of that we put away. We put away. You know, there's a, there's a story in the Bible that captures this better than I think any other story, and it's the story of Joseph. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the Bible, the very first book of the Bible is called Genesis, which means beginnings. And there's a story of a family in there. It starts in chapter 37, goes all the way to the end of the book. I'd encourage you to read it. But there's a, 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 a family of brothers. All these brothers hate one of the youngest brothers. They hate him so much they want to kill him. But instead of killing him, they sell him into slavery. And he's taken off. He's 17 years old when they sell him. His life is smashed because of what they did to him. This is unbelievable evil that they committed against him. But he never held this against his brothers. All the time that he was going through one unbelievably difficult situation after another as a result of what they had done to him. He never built up a heart of revenge or unforgiveness or bitterness towards his family. And many years later, he came back into relationship with them. He had the opportunity to revenge himself. He could have smashed his brothers in this other circumstance. But I want you to read the words that he spoke to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me. He names the sin. You, know, you committed evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. God took that terrible situation and worked through it to bring salvation of Egypt and Israel. It's a phenomenal breakthrough on God's part because Joseph was willing to trust him all the way through. And then he says this to his brothers. So therefore, 
Do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. That's a person who really forgave. Because you cannot do these things with someone if you've not forgiven them from your heart. To promise, to bless them, to help them, to speak kindly to them, to comfort them. That's all coming from a heart of a person who has truly forgiven. What happens to us, though, if we decide, no, 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 I'm not forgiving. No way. I want payment. I want payment from this person. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15 says this, Pursue peace with everyone and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. I want to show you a picture of a, a root of bitterness. It looks something like this. If any of you have worked in a garden, have you seen a weed like that? What does a weed look like when it first takes root? It's, you know, it's a little sapling, little, little guy like this. How difficult is it to remove? Oop. It's not difficult at all. But if I do not attend to my garden, if I do not take care of, it's going to grow into this. It's going to take over. It's going to have a root so deep, I'm going to have to excavate all the other good things growing in my garden in order to get down, 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 and get that thing all the way out. It's going to be unbelievably hard work to get it out. This is what is going on in our hearts when we refuse to forgive. It, it's a root of bitterness that begins to grow. I'm not seeking peace. I am not willing to forgive. And this scripture says, I am causing trouble for everyone. And many people will be defiled around me because I am not willing to forgive. When a person holds on to unforgiveness, cultivates thoughts of, of resentments and revenge, this root grows into poisonous weed and begins to defile other areas of your life and other people. A person who is in, in bitterness and unforgiveness is radiating anger and bitterness. It comes out in sarcasm. It starts infecting other people with a bad attitude towards, towards God, towards other people towards leadership of an organization or a church or whatever, it, it just starts to spread. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we need to take seriously when we are holding on to unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness in our heart. We need to recognize what we're doing not only to ourselves, but to everyone else around us. A person who holds on to these things it's not understanding the number one thing we talked about, how much God has forgiven us. If we truly understand what God has done for us, we quickly pass it on, the forgiveness to other people. This is why we come to the table. This is what Jesus said when he said, remember, remember, we need to remember what I did here for you. And when we remember, then we will stop that process of allowing this kind of weed to grow in our hearts. I, I, I found this quotation by a man named Ray, Ray Stedman. I thought it was a very appropriate conclusion. I do not think there is anything more contrary 
to the Christian spirit than to have an unforgiving heart, holding a grudge, refusing to speak to another Christian, or behaving coldly in relationship with each other. Nothing is more removed from the spirit of Christian forgiveness than this. How do we know that we have forgiven someone truly? It's pretty easy. It's when that person walks into the room that you're in and your heart doesn't go, <clears throat> you know, your heart squeeze. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Thank you, a hand in the back. Yes. When you hear that person's name come up in a conversation, you go, <clears throat> in your spirit. You may not, uh, it may not be obvious to others, but something's going on inside of yourself. You hear that something bad has happened to that person, you go, yes! Oh, oh so, no, no, oh, that's terrible. But not really, not in my spirit. That's, that's all stuff that says, okay, no, 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 you haven't gone through the process. I think somebody described forgiveness like an onion, peeling an onion. The layer after layer and lots and lots of tears through every layer. But you get to the, you finish, finish it, then you are done. When that person comes into the room and you have no negative reaction, then you know you have forgiven. It's like Joseph's story. You can speak with them with kindness. You can bless them. You can be happy for their successes. You can be genuine in your grief for their pain. This is true forgiveness.